Hello, I'm Ben Gosden, and I'm the pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church. This church, for me, embodies uh, what is so amazing about faith in God. We put on our front sign, and we mean it in every aspect of the life of this church, that all are welcome here. We really mean it. Everybody is welcome at Trinity Church because we believe that God welcomes all people into the life of faith. We try to express what a radical and inclusive uh, love of God looks like and we try to share that with others. Flannery O'Connor is a great Savannah writer and she would write often about how God's love was this shocking and surprising thing. The truth is I think lots of people have been hurt by the church, turned off by the church. We're all broken but here at Trinity Church we are a broken people but we really really want to surprise you with a different experience of church. One where you feel welcome, where you're accepted, where everybody can grow and thrive and, and, and come together. We have children of all ages. We have aging persons. We have corporate types. We have uh, persons who live on the streets uh, who all come here on Sunday mornings because we really want to surprise you with what God's love looks like. We worship every Sunday at 11 o'clock and we really want to see you there. Here's a treat. You can park in the parking garage right behind the church and get out for free on Sundays with your church bulletin. We really want to make room for you, and we hope to see you here next Sunday at Trinity Church. Hey guys, welcome to this United Methodist Women's Sunday. We are so excited that you're here and joining us for worship. Uh, we uh, welcome our United Methodist Women. You'll see many of them leading worship throughout uh, this service today, and we're grateful for their leadership and their ongoing ministry in the life of the church. For announcements this morning, I wanted to just go over five things that you need to know as we look to reopen our building next week for in-person worship. As we've been saying uh, now for a couple of weeks, we're going to become, we're transitioning into becoming one church with two campuses, one in person and one online. And so here are five things that you need to know uh, if you plan to come to the building next Sunday. The first is this, wear your mask. 
wear your mask. Masks are going to be mandatory. They are mandatory throughout Savannah, Chatham County. Uh, please come to church with your mask. If you forget by chance that uh, your mask in the car or if you forget it at home, we will be happy to provide you with a mask. But everyone in the sanctuary is required to wear a mask. It's just what we do to love our neighbors well. So wear your mask is the first thing. The second thing we want you to know is to wash your hands. Now, we're going to help you with that because we've got some new hand sanitizer dispensers around the building. We've got, they're all touch free. We've got one uh, freestanding one that's going to be right there at the entrance when you come in the main doors, the big red doors uh, off Telfair Square. But just swipe your hand underneath them and give your hands a quick wash. And, and whenever you go through the building, if you see one, uh, and it's been a while since you've washed your hands, just give it a quick wash. But wash your hands so that we can be sure that we don't spread germs. The third thing that we want you to know is that you need to be mindful of remembering remaining distanced from, uh, from others. So what we're going to do in the sanctuary to do this is we're going to have uh, designated pews that are open and some that are going to be closed so that we can keep distance between uh, our, ourselves and our neighbors. Now, that might mean that your favorite pew uh, could be closed. And so we ask you just to be patient with us uh, for a while while we kind of live into this new reality. So you can get a pew nearby, but we're just trying to keep distance in the room as much as possible. If we do end up uh, getting crowds large enough that distancing on the floor becomes difficult, we will look at opening our balcony, the side seating there to uh, put people who are physically able to climb stairs uh, to possibly put them in the balcony. But that's weeks ahead, so just know that we're going to do everything we can to stay distanced in the building. The fourth thing that we want you to know as we look to reopen the building is that kids have two options for church. Uh, two options in the building, I should say. The first option is that kids are welcome to go directly to their second floor space, the Trinity Kids space. Uh, we will not have a children's sermon. Children will not be moving around, transitioning from the sanctuary to the second floor, so they can go straight to the second floor. Our staff will have masks, they'll have uh, face shields, and they will be there to welcome you uh, and your child uh, for Trinity Kids time. Uh, the second option for kids is that they are welcome in the sanctuary, but they have to stay with their family. So we won't have a children's moment, but kids are welcome to stay with parents. Uh, they can stay in the sanctuary and uh, sit nearby. If kids go to the sanctuary, be sure to wear a mask when you're in there. In the Trinity Kids space, uh, it's optional mostly because it's hard to keep a mask on a toddler potentially. And so if you want your child to wear a mask, they're welcome to wear one. Uh, but there may, may be other kids that masks are hard to keep on them. So second floor kids space, mask if you want them. If your kids uh, want to sit with families in the sanctuary for the service, they're welcome, but they must wear a mask when they uh, do that. The fifth thing that we want you to know as we look to reopen our building is this. If you feel more comfortable staying online, stay online. Again, we're one church with two campuses, and so we are excited uh, to, to, uh, to start this hybrid model of church. And if you're more comfortable staying online for our live stream, we are going to continue doing that. We're going to continue improving our live stream experience. We're going to continue putting out more content to help you grow in your faith online. Our small groups are even remaining online for the time being. So if you're looking for a small group, uh, we can connect you with that. So if you feel better staying online uh, for the coming weeks or the coming months or just for the foreseeable future until vaccines and things like that uh, come, come out to the public, you're welcome to do that. You are still a part of Trinity Church, whether you're in our in-person campus or whether you're uh, attending via our online campus. So those are five things that we want you to know as we look to reopen our church next week to become one church with two campuses.
please join me in the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to God and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor cried out, and the Lord heard and saved them out of their troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Today's affirmation of faith is from 1 Timothy. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, and taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen.
Hey guys, it's Miss Rebecca here to be your children's moment. Have you ever been invited to a party or a wedding or something super special? You got an invitation in the mail that said something like you're invited. How did that feel to get an invitation? I know I would feel like happy or excited. I would wonder what's this party for and when is it? Now parties right now are looking a little bit different, aren't they? Like we might not necessarily be going to these big parties, um, certainly aren't around a lot of people. Definitely when we go places, we wanna wear our mask and make sure that we're being safe. Um, so birthday parties lately have been different. They might be a drive-by or maybe something on Zoom. Um, but you know, my favorite thing about like a real old fashioned party is getting a goodie bag, getting something special special to, to remind me of the party um, and in my goodie bag I have all kinds of cool things like crayons and a hand popper you know all kinds of fun things that you get at a goodie bag at a party a necklace oh this goodie bag even has hand sanitizer so that's super cool and you know appropriate for right now but the most special thing in this goodie bag that I've never seen in a birthday party or a wedding favor bag before is a cross and that reminds me that Jesus is with us and the most awesome party ever is celebrating Jesus and his love for us so I want you to know that you all are invited to church Jesus loves us Jesus loves you no matter where you are whether you're celebrating Jesus from your own living room or whether you're celebrating from here in church which we're going to start next week on the 18th it doesn't matter because he's going to be with us and he loves us so next week we're going to be here in church october 18th and we're also going to be online so there's going to be two campuses two ways to celebrate jesus and who's it for it's for everyone and that's what I love about Trinity Church, is we are here for everybody. Just like we want to be friends and be kind to as many people as possible, Trinity Church is here for every single person. So let's pray real quick. Dear God, thank you so much for being my friend and for letting me be a friend to you. Thank you for taking care of me and all of my friends and family and teaching us how to be kind to everyone everywhere. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, as we gather in our living rooms and dens and porches across our world, we name those we love in our hearts that are in special need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Our loving God, we gather today on this United Methodist Women's Sunday. We are mindful of all the ministries that United Methodist women carry out all over the globe. We pray now for the multitude of women and children that benefit from these ministries. The programs at Wesley Community Center, Open Door, educational programs in the Congo, schools for girls in third world countries, programs to combat systemic racism, prison ministry, equal rights for all people. Give us guidance and strength for the job ahead. We also pray for this church, Trinity United Methodist Church, as its members strive to be your people on this corner. We pray for our country as we remain in a state of chaos, chaos with COVID-19, with plans to reopen our sanctuary, chaos in the political arena as we draw closer to our election day, chaos with the emotions that run high and hate being seen in the streets every day. God, we need your vision. We need to stand firm knowing that you are in charge and that you are with us, around us, and ahead of us if we but listen. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever. Amen. Each year, we honor some of our dedicated United Methodist women with special recognition pins. This year, we have an extra pin to give. Connie Boole, you want to come on up here? Connie served as our president for over five years, and she has been a faithful leader to our church and to our UMW. And after stepping down from the Trinity UMW president role last year, she took on the role of president for the entire Coastal District UMW. And Connie is doing a wonderful job for our district, which reaches from Effingham County all the way down to the Florida border. We are honoring Connie today with the president's pin, which also serves as a past president pin. She can wear this pin with pride as she continues to work with our Trinity UMW and as the current president of the Coastal District United Methodist Women. Thank you, Connie. Our next pin is for a faithful servant who has been the secretary for our Trinity UMW for more than four years, Heather Harvey. Come on, Heather. <laughs> Heather has gone above and beyond her role as secretary, and she has helped us with many new online ventures and projects, and we appreciate all that she has done for Trinity during her time as our secretary. Heather will be stepping down as secretary in January, but we know that she will continue to serve and be a part of us while lending her expertise to our unit. Thank you, Heather. 
We have two more ladies to honor, but they are not able to be with us today. But they have been faithful United Methodist women for many, many years. So we'll get your pens to you very soon. For Mel Bailey has been a United Methodist member throughout her life with Ralph as he served as a minister in various Methodist churches in our conferences, including Trinity. We appreciate Vermel's dedication to our church and to our UMW. Thank you, Vermel. Linda Wing. Linda Wing has been a dedicated member of our United Methodist Women for a long time. She is always willing to present wonderful programs for our meetings, and she makes delicious food for our gatherings. And Linda has been a constant presence in our group, and we love her dearly. Thank you, Linda. I want to thank all of the ladies of Trinity United Methodist Women. You are all very special, and we love each and every one of you very, very much. Thank you all for the love and support that you show the women and children of the world through your dedication to the United Methodist Women's Organization. Our Rekindle the Flame for Mission Giving is a special ceremony of the United Methodist Women. It is done to remember and honor our loved ones. We light one candle for those who passed away, one candle for those adults who are present with us, and one candle for the children who are our future. The money collected to remember and honor our loved ones is used for our many local and global missions. Through these ministries, the United Methodist Women are able to help the most vulnerable people, women and children, here and around the world. We rekindle the flame in the memory of the following adults. Rita McCauley, Stanley and Blakely, Lytle Bevel, Merle Hodges, Thelma Hendricks, Ruth Akins, Patricia Jeter, Mary Modell, Wanima St. John, John and Irene Boole, May Wong Lee, Joe Fang Lee, and Gerald and Gloria Tech. We rekindle the flame in honor of the following adults. Talene Drzmalski, Ben and Katie Gosden, Kay Irvin, Carol Abercrombie, Linda Wing, and Brian and Leanne Gottfried. We rekindle the flame in honor of the following children. Dora Watford, Ruby Watford, Violet Powell, Joel McKinney, Jake McKinney, Eli Alexander Godfrey, Olivia Gosden, Sam Gosden, Marshall Dramalski, and Sydney Dramalski. We are very honored today to have as our speaker for the United Methodist Women's Service, Allison Lindsay. Allison currently serves as the director in the Office of Connection Ministries for the South Georgia Annual Conference after serving eight years as an associate director. She is passionate about local church ministry, resourcing churches of all shapes and sizes across South Georgia, and being with the connection. Allison serves beyond the South Georgia Conference, representing South Georgia as a lay delegate to the General Conference in 2012, 2016, and will serve in the postponed General Conference gathering. She has served as a director for the General Board of Global Ministries for eight years and will finish her term in 2021. Allison is married to Dr. Griff Lindsay, DMD. They reside in West Green, Georgia, and they have three grown children. When she catches downtime, Allison loves to read and hike and spend time outdoors. So we welcome Allison as our speaker today.
Well, good morning, Trinity. It is so wonderful to be with you this morning, even if it's virtually, and I can't wait for the day that I can come worship with you in person. Ben and I have been trying to make this happen for quite a while, and so thank you for the opportunity and the invitation. And I don't know that I ever really appreciated when pastors um, talked to me and shared with me about how challenging it is to preach to an empty sanctuary or just in front of a camera. And I certainly am gaining some understanding around that today. October is also Pastor Appreciation Month, and I just wanted to take a moment to tell you how much I appreciate your pastor. It's um, Ben is, um, I call him a friend and, and thankful for his friendship. He leads with great wisdom and the way that he encourages and empowers you as a church to be the church. And it's just so exciting to see the ministries that um, are bearing such fruits there at Trinity um, around the justice team and the work of the UMW and, and so much more. And so I uh, think that you, uh, this, what I'm sharing with you today in this talk is something that I think about when I think about Trinity United Methodist Church, and so I hope that it resonates with you all as well. We're going to dive into um, our scripture is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 13 and 14 this morning, and we're going to talk a little bit about the parable of the great banquet. And we have a series of parables um, here in Luke. From the beginning of this chapter, we find Jesus dining with the group of leaders, with his disciples, and at the home of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. And the religious leaders are watching him really closely. Um, they have always kept him um, in sight so they can try to trip him up and they're always challenging what he's doing. And even during this time that they're gathering, he dared to heal a man on the Sabbath. And so again, we just see Jesus um, pushing the boundaries and breaking the rules and ushering in the kingdom of God and teaching that in new ways. And so we're going to begin in verse 13. Um, the scripture says, he said, and this is Jesus, to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now my springboard um, today is verse 13 and 14 that was included in what we just read. And, and Jesus is giving instructions to this Pharisee, but also in true Jesus form, he begins to share the point of his, of his um, this nugget of truth in a parable, in a story, with familiar situations that everyone could relate to. So the parable actually begins in verse 16, and I'm going to kind of give you the cliff note version as we go through. So a man invites um, many to a banquet, his friends, his neighbors, and his family. Now I learned that in the first century, when someone was invited to a banquet, they would be invited to the date but it would not include the time. So people would RSVP to the date of this big feast and this big dinner. And then when the feast was ready, the host would send a servant out to go collect the guest, to gather the guests who had um, RSVP, who said that they would be a in attendance. So the feast is ready, the servant goes out, and as he begins to gather the guests, he begins to get excuse after excuse after excuse. Maybe you can relate to this as well. Um, one person had bought a field and had to, go, had to go see about it. Another person had purchased some oxen and had to go examine them. Um, one of the excuses was that they got married, and I can't imagine how they would not realize that that was all happening. And so the servant comes back and he tells the host all the excuses and that nobody is coming. And I imagine the host was very angry. He um, had prepared all of this. What was he going to do with everything that, that he had prepared? And it would be a tremendous insult to have said, I'm coming and then not be there. So he instructs the servant to go quickly out into the streets and to 
and into the alleys and to bring the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. People who do not normally get invited to these feasts. Now the servant did this and there was still room at the table. There was still room in the banquet. So he sent the servant back out, it says, to the roads and to the country lanes. So he goes out farther to compel people to come. He wants this room filled. He wants every seat at the table filled. What a beautiful analogy that is. And can you imagine the energy around this table of those that never get invited to feasts or banquets or feel like they belong or are included, but here they are in one great space together. Now, the parable ultimately represents God's big picture of his redemption story in which the Israelites reject salvation through Jesus Christ. And that invitation to come to the Lord's table is an extended from the Jews to us, to the Gentiles. And this, um, the point of Jesus' parable here is that the guest list for the kingdom of God will look much different than the dinner guests that he is dining with that night, the Pharisees and his friends can imagine. Now, I love our new annual conference theme, Alive Together at the Table. And this morning, I want to talk with you for just a little bit about tables. Different types of tables uh, create a different dynamic, don't they? And so when, what comes to mind when you think about a few of these tables? A kitchen table a formal dining room table? What about a conference table, a business table? A picnic table? Or a cafe table, where you have smaller tables in a cafe and lots of conversations happening at one time? As I think about these various tables, I get a very different vibe for each one. Some are more relaxed and casual, and some are very structured and formal. Some have tremendous energy and that energy could be very positive and others might have a very intense, maybe a negative um, energy that, that, we, that comes to mind. But just what is it about a table? What is it that happens around these tables that take on these different dynamics and, and these different feelings that they elicit? The first thing that comes to mind is conversations. When we are gathered around a table, we um, are invited into a space to talk to one another and to engage in conversation, get to know one another better, or have some serious conversations. What about um, when I think about the conference table, you think about negotiations or mediation that can take place or, or transactions becoming um, important space for that. Games. Anyone have family game nights around the table? Those can be fun for all ages to gather around. The other thing I thought about was puzzles. Now at my house, when I get out a puzzle and I bring it to the table, every teenager, young adult in my house rolls their eyes and like, oh, mom's at it again. But I'll get out this, this puzzle and I'll sit down at the table and I'll start to do the straight edges. And before long, you know what happens? Somebody walks by and they can't resist. They just have to put one or two pieces down. And so they begin to kind of look and, and soon another person will walk by the table and they'll think that they're just going to put a few pieces down. And before you know it, I have everybody gathered at the table for 30 or 45 minutes or more at a time. And that table, until we finish the puzzle, it stays up and everybody just kind of gathers at different times and I love it. And then what will happen is they, someone in my family will hide the last piece because they may have teased me about getting it out in the beginning, but they're going to be the person to put the last piece in the puzzle. So it always makes for some good family fun. Hospitality. Hospitality happens around tables. Healing and reconciliation can happen around tables. When we sit down together to to talk and to come to some understanding of one another where um, healing and reconciliation can take place. Decisions. There are lots of decisions that are made around a table. What about friendships? 
friendships are nurtured and they are blossomed around a table, spending time together. And of course, um, you might have thought of this one first, eating. Eating is one of our favorite things to do around the table. And of course, we're good Methodists, so we love to cook and bring casseroles and, and eat and gather around the table. So a table can this be this common place for so many different things to happen. There's even a different experience that you get when you're sitting at a rectangular table that might be a long table. And when you're at a round table where you can see each other eye to eye and converse, when you're at a rectangular table, you can, you're kind of limited to who is directly sitting around you. So even those dynamics, the very table itself can set the tone for what's taking place and, and that dynamic. Now, growing up um, over the holidays, it was always my job to help set the table to, at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And one of the first things that we always had to do was get the leaf out. The leaves to the table were always under the bed because we only used them that one time of year. And why did we do this? Because we needed to build a bigger table. We would have company coming and we needed room for more. So with each leaf that was added, added this amazing capacity to seat more at the table. So soon a table for four would seat six and then it would seat eight and it would just continue to get bigger. And you take the piano bench and put it along the side and you could even squeeze in some more. So we were always excited about the holidays and having more people gathered and building that bigger table. And here's another holiday table for you. What about the kids' table? Like, that is the best place to be. And even as an adult, sometimes I think I would choose the kids' table. But I also remember at that age what a rite of passage it was to be promoted from the kids' table to the adult table. Or maybe there was even an in-between where you sat with the teenagers and, and the younger adults and before you moved to the adult table. So there's a lot of fun memories around the kids' table as well. And you know, even during COVID, as strange as this might sound, Zoom has become somewhat of a virtual table. And it has helped us to stay connected in ways that we have not been able to do or would not have been able to do without the technology. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And with Connectional Ministries, we've launched our conversations um, that used to be our Zoom at noon. And we now call them conversations at the table and to go along with that theme alive together at the table. So around the table, we find connection, don't we? We find energy that's created when people feel seen and they feel heard and valued. And connection does not easily happen in rows, but when you're gathered around the table where you can see each other and interact, we find some, some wonderful connection. In May, we hosted an agape meal with Bishop Brian virtually. And Bishop Brian and Miss Cheryl hosted us around their table in their home. And the Agape Meal unites Christians in table fellowship using the cup and bread and scripture and prayer for encouragement and support. And the next day I received an email from a pastor and she forwarded an email to me from a 70 year old woman in her congregation. And I wanna read a portion of this to you this morning. The email read, it was a pleasure to join Bishop Bryant and Miss Cheryl for the Agape Meal. It was the first time in a long time that I sat across the table and had people to see. It was not only a peaceful and spiritual experience, but for someone living alone, it was a blessing to see faces and hear voices in my home. That was so powerful to me that through this virtual table gathering, another person felt so connected and so encouraged. And that was through a computer. So don't ever discount or doubt your online ministry presence. And I know you all at Trinity have worked very hard around that online presence. And I think moving forward, it's not going to be an either or with 
with in person or online, it's going to be a both and because the gospel is reaching households in ways that we don't even know and that we can't even imagine because it's so accessible. So the, the first thing that happens around the table, we talked about connection. The second thing is community. Once connections are made and relationships are built, this creates a sense of belonging, doesn't it? And that creates community. And it doesn't matter who does or doesn't believe the same way as each of us do. But what matters is who is there and who is not there. It's the type of community that makes our larger community better. So in addition to community, then you have commitment. And as we build relationships and we share our faith, and we invite people to the heavenly banquet table into communion with our heavenly father, our faith community grows. And we, um, we see that commitment is made, um, strengthens our, our need and for community and to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we invite others in to be a part of that beautiful community. And then we also have communion. The fourth piece of this is communion. As a faith community, we enter into sacred space. When we come to the Lord's table and we find communion with God and with one another. And the elements and the body and the blood of Christ are given to us. And, and what does the liturgy say? There, there's a beautiful piece that you are so familiar with that, that the pastor says. And it says, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Have you ever really meditated on that? That we may be for the world the body of Christ. We are an extension of the Lord's table. And it is amazing that God um, allows us to partner with him in ministry and the ways that he uses us. He doesn't need us, but he uses us in big ways. But there are a few things that you need to know as you begin to create this space and, and as you begin to build this bigger table and as you seek to create space that gives connection and community and commitment and invites people into communion. The first thing that you need to know is you've got to have passion. Passion can be contagious, but we have got to have passion for the least and the last and the lost. Remember who Jesus said to invite to the banquet? The message translation, it says, invite some people who never get invited out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. And then it goes on to say, you'll be and experience a blessing. Who wants to be a blessing and experience a blessing? I'm in. So in addition to passion, we've got to have persistence. And as you begin to reach out and you begin to invite others to this table, you also might get all sorts of excuses, just as the host did in the parable. You also might even get some rejection. But don't give up. Who are we compelling to come to the table? You can go out, remember the host sent his servant first out into the streets and the alleys, which has this closer feel. But then when he came back and there was still more room, where did he send them? Out to the roads and the country lanes. He went farther out. There are people that God puts in our path every single day that need Jesus and need hope, especially during this time. They might just be waiting for that invitation. So passion and persistence and preparation. What type of atmosphere do you wish to create? What type of dynamic do you want to have at your table? You can set the tone. How do we make our tables welcoming? How do we make our churches more welcoming? How do we make our online presence even more welcoming? We did find some fascinating preparation in the Old Testament. And in Exodus, the Israelites were given very specific instructions for how to build the table of worship that was in the temple and in the tabernacle. 
Now this table was called the table of the showbread. And it was second only to the Ark of the Covenant. And this table was to always have bread on it. The Hebrew word for showbread translates to bread of presence, literally means bread of presence. And the purpose of this table was to represent God's very presence and his abundant grace. And the scriptures are filled with all sorts of imagery about the table. There are a few questions I would like for us to think about this morning and to take with us through the rest of this week. How big is our table? How big is my table? How big is your table? How welcoming is my table? Is our table? How am I using my table? There's a lot of different ways that we can use our table. So let's be intentional and prepare on how we want to use it. Here's an important one. Who is at my table? Is it just your friends and your family and your neighbors? And if that's the case, then the more important question to ask is, who is not at my table? And when you think about who is not at your table, take it one step further and ask yourself, what's preventing people from being at my table? Are they waiting for an invitation? Is the message I'm sending that they're receiving different from what I'm trying to send? Am I creating um, a, an unwelcoming or an environment that they might not feel like they belong? I was recently on a Zoom call with a pastor and, um, and members of their church in Savannah. Um, it's a multicultural church connection, you know it well. And as we were seeking to learn from this congregation, Bishop Brian asked the question of those that were on the call, what drew you to be a part of a multicultural congregation? And I'll never forget, one of the individuals just immediately said, because it looks like the world. Isn't that beautiful? That diversity looks like the world. For God so loved the world. And we have so much to learn from each other. God invites us to his table. And he in turn asks us to build a bigger table. And as we reach out to those who are different than us, if we embrace the diversity for the least and the last and the lost, others can come and experience the showbread the presence, the very presence of God at our tables. And it's through our hospitality and our generosity that we can truly be alive together in Christ. So my prayer for us all is that we will just have open hearts and open eyes to ways that we can begin to build bigger tables and that we can continue to be alive together in Christ. Let us pray. Father, for the gift of your table, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the showbread, your very presence that is always with us, here with us this morning and here with us as we leave this place. Father, help us to have um, a heart, a passion, to, to build that passion for the least and the last and the lost. Help us not to give up, but to have persistence, even when we experience excuses and rejection, Father. Help us to have open eyes to those that you put in our path every day that need hope, and then they need Jesus Christ. And Father, help us in our preparation. Help us again to have eyes to see who is at our table, who is not at our table, who needs to be at our table. And maybe, Father, there's some things within ourselves that we need to work on to be more welcoming and to be more opening to others. And if that's the case, then work on us. Work in us and work through us. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and that you have built a great big table that has room for all. Help us to have the sense of urgency as the host did, to, to quickly go out and invite others 
to this table and to share your love. We give you all the praise and the glory for we seek to be the light and the salt that you have called us to be in this world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for the invitation to be with you. Thank you, Ben, for um, helping me get this um, video and everything going. And I truly look forward to a time when I can be with you in person. Thank you, Allison, for that wonderful message uh, that you shared with us today. We come now to worship God with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, you're going to see uh, links there in the comments on Facebook where you can uh, give online. You can give through Venmo. Uh, you can text to give. Uh, we have many ways that you can do that. Uh, you can uh, also go to trinity 1848 uh, .org backslash give in case you're watching on YouTube uh, or one of our other uh, platforms there. But just a note about the giving. We are so grateful for your ongoing generosity. It's because of you that we're able to continue to offer ministry. And uh, next week, we'll be able to do it in, in two different worlds, the physical and the uh, online world. It's because of you that our Backpack Buddy Ministries uh, uh, continue to thrive, that our mission and outreach continue to grow. Uh, it's because of you that people's lives are being changed and they're growing in their faith. And so thank you for living your discipleship journey by giving uh, through the life and ministry of Trinity Church. Also, real quick, I almost forgot, if you want to mail a check, you can mail a check to uh, Trinity 18, or excuse me, 225 West President Street, uh, Savannah, Georgia, uh, 31401. However you give, just know how grateful we are. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is with glad and generous hearts that we Give these gifts to you now that you may bless them and use them for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
the doors of Trinity Church are open if you wish to join your life with the life of this congregation, uh, whether physically or even online. We're extending our membership uh, beyond just the, the four walls of our sanctuary, that if you're uh, out of town or maybe you found us during this pandemic and you've been worshiping regularly with us and you want to take that next step in your discipleship journey and, and join uh, in membership with Trinity Church, you can uh, let us know uh, through the comments. You can reach out to us directly, but but the doors are open. If you wish to, to take that step in discipleship to uh, commit your life, maybe even for the first time, uh, to Jesus Christ as you seek to be a follower in and through the life of Trinity Church. We invite you to come. Life is good. May the God of life go with you, send you out dancing for joy to be his light, turned loose on a world that desperately needs his love. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for this live stream worship experience. We hope that it was a meaningful experience for you. If you would like to know more about what's happening in the life of Trinity Church, or if you'd like to connect with us, uh, maybe through membership or how to grow in your faith, go to trinity1848.org and you can explore our website, fill out our online connection card. Most of all, we look forward to seeing you again soon for our worship online or in person here at Trinity Church.